So, welcome back. This is going to be our last video talking about mitochondrial ion transport. And here I'm going to specifically talk about calcium transport in mitochondria. So, many eukaryotes, but not all, have a specific pathway to take up calcium into mitochondria, have a mitochondrial calcium uniporter. Uh, the molecular identity of this uniporter is known, and we also know the identity and function of many accessory proteins of this uniporter. I'm not going to go into the whole structure and function of this complex that's the mitochondrial calcium uh, uniporter complex and transport complex because this is a course in which we really want to understand how to measure things primarily. So because this is a pathway that's absent in some eukaryotes, this is not an essential pathway for oxidative phosphorylation, but it is a pathway that's important to control calcium levels uh, in the cell and therefore participates in cell signaling. The mitochondrial calcium uniporter has an affinity for calcium that's not very high, so it will start transporting calcium around 200 to 500 nanomolar or extra mitochondrial calcium. Uh, and for a long time, people thought that this meant that this uniporter only acted when calcium was elevated within the cell to non-physiological levels, because the average cytosol concentration of calcium is around 100, maybe 150 nanomolar. So it didn't seem like mitochondria would take up calcium under physiological conditions. But as time went by, people noticed that there are really microenvironments of calcium within the cell in which physiologically calcium concentrations are more elevated. And mitochondria specifically interacting with the ER, which releases calcium, and also mitochondria interacting with the plasma membrane and receiving calcium from the extracellular environment can actually physiologically take up calcium into the mitochondrial matrix. Now, if affinity for calcium of the mitochondrial calcium uniporter is relatively low compared to the ER, the ability to accumulate calcium, the capacity of mitochondrial calcium uptake, is very, very high. Mitochondria can take up large quantities of calcium in their matrix, and actually you can have the formation of calcium phosphate precipitates in the matrix once calcium concentrations reach a saturation level within the matrix. So the amount of calcium that mitochondria can take up is much, much larger than the amount of calcium than the ER can take up. Low affinity, high capacity calcium uptake. Now, if mitochondria take up calcium, they have to have a mechanism to release calcium. And mitochondria do have a calcium sodium exchanger known as the NCLX. We also know the molecular identity of the calcium sodium exchanger. This was characterized by Israel Seckler's group about 10 years ago. There is also evidence based on kinetic studies for a calcium proton exchanger, but there really isn't as much consensus on a structure of a protein that's involved in this calcium uh, proton exchange mechanism versus the calcium sodium exchange mechanism that is very well characterized. So how can we measure calcium uptake in vitro, in isolated mitochondria or permeabilized cells? I'm going to talk about how to measure these things in vivo and in intact cells in our next class, which is going to be bioenergetic measurements in vivo. But for now, I want to tell you how you can measure calcium uptake either in isolated mitochondria or permeabilized cells. When you're measuring calcium uptake in mitochondria, because they can take up so much calcium, and because this calcium can actually precipitate in the matrix, if you measure calcium concentrations in the matrix, you may underestimate the amount of calcium uptake because of these precipitates. You won't have that calcium as free calcium, and therefore you won't detect it with a probe that's in the mitochondrial matrix. That's why with isolated mitochondria and permeabilized cells, we tend to prefer measuring extra mitochondrial calcium and seeing how much mitochondria take up as a measurement of mitochondrial calcium uptake. And you can measure extra mitochondrial calcium either using calcium sensitive electrodes or using probes that have a low affinity for calcium. If you have a high affinity for calcium, they'll probably be saturated all the time. So you need probes that have low affinity for calcium. Uh, my lab uses a lot of calcium green for these measurements. We find 
it has a very good signal to noise ratio. Importantly, you want to use calcium green in its non-esterified form. Calcium green AM is also sold, but you want the calcium green form that's not membrane permeable because you want the probe to be only outside mitochondria. You don't want to measure intramitochondrial calcium. So if you're measuring extra mitochondrial calcium and you add mitochondria to the suspension and follow calcium concentrations by the fluorescence of calcium green, what you're going to see is a decrease in fluorescence which reflects a decrease in calcium concentrations outside mitochondria. And that's because mitochondria are taking up this calcium within their matrix and removing it from the media in which the probe is. Uh, this is just a typical trace from uh, work from our group, but we didn't invent this technique. This has been done for a number of years before this. After that, you can add more and more boluses of extra mitochondrial calcium and watch mitochondria as they take up this calcium and finally, as they get saturated with too much calcium and can actually release calcium back into the medium. With these kinds of traces in which you add many different boluses of calcium, you can actually do three different measurements. You can measure first the velocity in which calcium is removed from the media. This is the speed in which calcium is being taken up by these mitochondria. You can measure how much calcium mitochondria take up before getting saturated with calcium. So you can measure the maximal calcium uptake capacity of these mitochondria. And finally, you can measure the affinity for calcium of these mitochondria. Although the affinity where mitochondria stop taking up calcium can be a little dirty because of the low affinity of the probe. So that can be more prone to errors, the, the affinity measurements. But it's actually a one trace measurement that gives you a lot of information. It gives you information on the speed of calcium uptake, also on the maximum calcium uptake capacity, and if mitochondria are releasing this calcium after they take up too much calcium. So that's a practical measurement for calcium uptake in vitro. We'll talk about measurements in vivo in the next class. Before I finish talking about mitochondrial calcium, I also have to talk very briefly about a phenomenon that leads to the release of mitochondrial calcium called the mitochondrial permeability transition. And I'm going to talk about this briefly because there's so much literature on this phenomenon that it's actually one of those phenomena in science in which if you're not thoroughly confused by the literature, you probably haven't read enough. There's really a lot of data and not a lot of consensus of what the mitochondrial permeability transition is. What we do know is that mitochondria, when challenged with excess calcium, with a lot of calcium, can have a loss of inner mitochondrial membrane integrity. And this is called the mitochondrial permeability transition. The phenomenon is at least temporarily and partially reversible. So if you remove this excess calcium, the inner mitochondrial membrane can reseal itself. And that's why the term used is mitochondrial permeability transition. Now, if the inner mitochondrial membrane loses its integrity, it's going to lose its impermeability to protons. So you will have a decrease in proton motive force. You will have a decrease in the inner mitochondrial membrane potential. Uh, this loss of integrity also allows for the uptake of both cations and anions in the suspension. So you will have osmotic swelling of mitochondria. And this osmotic swelling can lead to rupture first of the outer mitochondrial membrane and even sometimes of the inner mitochondrial membrane. So you can have loss of proteins, at least in the intermembrane space, secondarily to this rupture of the mitochondrial membranes. Uh, and this loss of proteins in the intermembrane space has been related to the triggering, for example, of apoptosis because they're pro-apoptotic proteins in the intermembrane space. So what causes permeability transition? There are a number of conditions that increase the, the tendency to undergo permeability transition in the presence of calcium. One of them is the presence of oxidants or reactive oxygen species. Uh, low antioxidant capacity, so low at ADPH, also increases the tendency to undergo permeability transition. Thiol oxidation, so membrane protein thiols when oxidized, will lead to the permeability transition. And also high pH levels in the cell uh, 
um, make these mitochondria more prone to undergo the permeability transition. These are some more physiologically and pathologically relevant conditions that promote the permeability transition. There are actually a lot more in the literature. But we know that the permeability transition is a regulated process to some degree. First of all, because you can reseal mitochondria at least temporarily by removing calcium. And second of all, because this process can be inhibited by cyclosporin A. Cyclosporin A acts by inhibiting cyclophilin D, so the activity of cyclophilin D is necessary for the mitochondrial permeability transition. And cyclophilin D is a cis transpeptidyl prolo isomerase. So again, this tells us that modifications in the structure of inner mitochondrial membrane proteins lead to this permeabilization, this non-selective permeabilization of the inner mitochondrial membrane known as the permeability transition. But what proteins are modified? Well, there's a lot of discussion in the literature right now. Uh, there are actually quite a few authors that believe that they know what proteins are involved specifically. I'm going to be more democratic and say that I believe that many different proteins can be involved. And it seems to me like there are different permeabilizations described as permeability transition involving different proteins being modified by oxidative modification in the presence of excess calcium. So that's what I wanted to tell you uh, about ion transport and how to measure it in isolated mitochondria and permeabilized cells. I'll see you again for next class where we'll see how to measure mitochondrial bioenergetics in situ in intact cells. Bye.